Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome to Good Books Radio. We have a great book for you today, The Strange Case of Dr. Cooney, How a Mysterious European Showman Saved Thousands of American Babies by Don Raffel. I'm your host today, Dr. W.F. Strong. Thank you for joining us. Let's get right to it. This is a marvelous book, um, one of the best I've read in a long time. It reminds me of the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, great scientific look at uh, how primies were discovered as babies, you might say, that could be saved. Here's the description of the book. At the turn of the 20th century, nestled near the sideshows of Coney Island, Atlantic City, sidled next to the technological wonders of the world's fairs, was a sight that fascinated spectators. Delicate, premature infants in rows of boxes, tended by a nurse. These babies, by all medical expertise at the time, should not have been alive. They were too small. They were too weak. Some were born with deformities. However, Dr. Martin Cooney had discovered how incubators and careful nursing kept these previously doomed infants alive, while at the same time made good money. They made good money displaying these babies alongside sword swallowers, bearded ladies, and burlesque shows. Yes, I agree. Bizarre, but that's the way it all began. We're going to be talking to Don Raffel today. Uh, She's the author of this wonderful book, and she's on the phone now, so we will go to her. Don, I want to welcome you to the program, Good Books Radio. Great to have you on. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. I loved your book. It's a magnificent book. I think that uh, I haven't read anything that has been as uh, captivating for me in a scientific sense since I read um, uh, the incredible, what is it called, The Incredible Life of Henrietta Lacks, I think. The Immortal Life. Yeah, oh yes, that's the point, The Immortal Life. <laughs> but your book is is of that genre to me, just really, really powerful. And so I, I want to begin with the thing that astounded me the most. How is it that these babies in incubators was thought of by someone outside of the normal institutions rather than someone, you know, who, who came out of a, a hospital? How did it come about this way? Well, the incubator as we know it was invented by a Frenchman named Alexander Lyon, um, and he was an engineer. He wasn't a doctor. Mm -hmm. And he started showing these incubator babies in Paris where you could pay a little money to see them. He called it a charity. And he took these incubators to the Berlin Industrial Exposition in 1896. And he showed the incubators as a new piece of technology, but with the baby in it. And he was making a big deal of saying, you see, this system is almost automatic. Mm -hmm. Um, This caused a huge splash all over the world. And so a minute later, all kinds of showmen wanted to get in on this act. So you had Bailey of Barnum & Bailey doing something in London. You had the Royal Aquarium in London had an incubator sideshow. Um, There were a lot of showmen. Most of them very quickly fell away because this was not a toaster oven. It was a tremendous amount of work to try to keep these babies alive and required very skilled nursing. Cooney just plain stayed with it, and he stayed with it. Um, In part, this was made possible by the fact that the medical establishment was really not picking up on it. Mm -hmm. And why? Why why didn't I would have thought that this would be something that they would say, my God, it's a miracle. Let's build a hospital wing devoted to this. But they seem to be content to just let these primies die. Well, I I spent a lot of time trying to get to the bottom of this, and there isn't any one simple answer. But partly there were doctors who tried using the incubators early on, and a machine is only as good as the people using it. So they really didn't have the skilled nursing that they needed to use these machines. Some of these early hospitals were not actually that clean. Um, They didn't have a protocol where these children were always fed breast milk only. Um, They didn't have nurses to take the hours and hours on end that you needed to feed these babies, a tiny little micro drop of nutrition at a time. So they weren't seeing good results anyway, and they didn't have the resources, and they had uh, a 
high mortality rate for, you know, for all newborns. So these little preemies, which were called weaklings in the medical literature, there just wasn't a big emphasis on saving them. Um, and later things got much worse because you had a eugenics movement in yeah. this country that created a very hostile environment toward anybody who was considered weak or not fit or needing some extra help. So the eugenics movement uh, leaned toward Darwinism, right? That the survival of the fittest uh, is is the dominant uh, perspective, and if they can't survive on their own, then they don't deserve to survive on their own. Well, there just wasn't, it didn't ever directly target preemies, but there was just not um, a lot of impetus to save them. And at the, one of the most shameful um, things that I saw was there was a doctor in Chicago who was very seriously advocating for if a child was born with a severe disability, just let it die. And he got a lot of traction. He got he was promoting this idea all over the country, and a lot of people agreed with that. So in that same environment, again, you know, preemies um, might grow up to have disabilities, you know, and there was a thought of, well, if we bother to save these children, maybe they'll never be productive citizens. Maybe they'll just be a drain on society. So it's nature's way. Maybe we should just let them go. Yeah, I, I read that letter that uh, it was an editorial, I think, uh, written in, uh, uh, published in a medical journal, which surprised me, and uh, it was brutal. I mean, he just said, uh, we don't need these... Uh, these defects to get uh, genetically pushed into the general population, so it's better for all of us that we let them go. Yeah, and I mean, he was using the terms of, you know, any good stock breeder would know oh. that you breed only the best. <laughs> yes, yes, he's compared to raising cattle. And, uh, just a, it's an astonishing essay for a medical man, it seems, but I guess we're, again, we're looking in hindsight from a... Uh, from the advantage of 70 years or so and looking back and saying how, how cruel and heartless <laughs> this this is. But the eugenics movement was uh, powerful around the world at the time. Um, it was, and it was very powerful here. And it was just, um, you know, even the Chicago, uh, the World's Fair where Cooney and his exhibition were out on the Midway in, in the Hall of Science, you had, again, you had eugenics there, you know, survival of the fittest, breeding the best. Um, and people didn't understand that you weren't, you know, if you were a preemie, you weren't going to grow up to be a weakling, and then you were going to have weak children and, and who knows what, um, you know. And so Cooney was also really trying to promote this idea that, no, you can save these children, and they can have full, happy lives. Well, a lot of these uh, showmen, the Barnum and Bailey types, who would use the babies as an ex exhibition and would make really good money off of them. Uh, one thing that I didn't understand is after the period of the, the fair or the, or the show was over, uh, what did they do with the babies? Well, the babies would go home at the end. So, you know, they'd sort of time it so these babies were ready to go home. At I see. the end of, you know, the exhibition, they would be weighing five pounds or so. The one exception was, um, so at the Chicago World's Fair, they had a baby um, at Atlantic City that was still under two pounds when the show in Atlantic City was closing. And Cooney's daughter at the time was a nurse. She was running the show in Atlantic City. He actually had his daughter take this baby on the train to Chicago where he was at the World's Fair. So a less than two pound baby all across the country on the train to get to Chicago. I read that story and uh, he went to enormous expense to bring that baby in controlled uh, environments all the way to Chicago, right? He did. And, you know, he was a complicated guy. He absolutely, he spared no expense. At the same time, he made a lot of money, mm -hmm. and he enjoyed it. And I don't think uh, he saw a conflict between being altruistic and his own self-interest. But he was running essentially a high-tech hospital wing in a carnival atmosphere, right? Yes, he was, and for these World's Fairs, you basically had to build an entire neonatal hospital, and then you had to tear it down in a year when the fair ended. Um, and there were instances of he tried to donate his equipment to the municipalities when he left, and they didn't want it. The only one that took him up on it was Chicago. Wow. 
Why? Do you have any idea why? Um, I think, you know, he was, uh, sometimes the medical establishment didn't necessarily hold him in high esteem. Sure. And they, for whatever reason, weren't necessarily equipped to, to handle the equipment either. But you tell the story of a, of a case where uh, a lady's given birth to twins, and one dies and the other one is born alive, but the doctor says, well, <laughs> don't don't bury that first one too fast because you're going to have another one here to take with you. Um, uh, tell that story. That's a, that's a, a powerful story, I think. Yeah, so the, this um, the parents, uh, the father was desperately pleading with the doctor, you know, my baby is still alive. Don't you have anything? He had actually seen the sideshow the summer before at his honeymoon in Atlantic City. And so he's asking him, aren't there machines for these babies? And the doctor is saying, well, we don't have those machines here, and it wouldn't matter anyway because this baby isn't going to live. Mm. And so the father picks up the baby in a towel, uh, hails a New York City taxi, and goes to Coney Island with the baby. I met the baby when she was 95 ah. years old. <laughs> That's such a great story. And so, But it's so bizarre. You, know, you leave the hospital to go to the carnival to save your child. It is very strange. And there was a, you know, another woman who told me that you know, much later she was born in a hospital. Her, she and her brother were premature twins. Her mother's hospital roommate had premature twins. The doctor came in and told both of them, if you want to save these children, you have to go to Coney Island. Uh-huh. And the other mother said, I'm not putting my children in a sideshow. Uh-huh. Um, and those two children died. Mm-hmm. And this mother said, you know what, if they have to go to the sideshow, then, then whatever it takes to save their life. Uh, and her children, they're both still alive. Why were people so interested in, in paying to see these babies? Well, it's fascinating. Dr. Cooney had a slogan, all the world loves a baby. Mm-hmm. And it's really true. People, you know, uh, it's hard to upstage a baby. People <laughs> yeah. have never seen babies this small. These mm-hmm. babies were two pounds. Sometimes they were less. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he had one instance of he had to stop people from poking their finger into the incubator because people oh. would think, oh, these babies must be wax. They can't be real. Oh, my. And so, you know, I mean, as I said in the book, I have to admit, I would have gone to see that show. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I suppose in the time I would have, too, particularly when you talk about how small they were. Uh, if people had never seen a baby that would, you know, fit in half of your hand, that's got to be an attraction in and of itself. And then the the incubators themselves were pretty impressive, right? They they were uh, a work of art of, in a sense for their time. They were impressive. They were state of the art. And um, Cooney had a great friendship with a Chicago physician named Julius Hess, who eventually became known as the father of clinical American neonatology. Um, and. Hess was inspired by Cooney and learned a lot from him, but when he designed his own incubators, the problem is they were kind of ugly. They looked like <laughs> ugly wash tubs, and you really couldn't see the baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and that design did not last. Um, the, you know, if you go to a, a NICU now, an incubator today would uh, bear a much closer relation to what Cooney had in the sense that you can see the baby. Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, and and that's important not only obviously for uh, the original effort at uh, the carnival sideshow, but obviously for uh, nurses, parents, uh, healthcare workers wanting to constantly have vigilance concerning the child. Yeah, uh, I was impressed when I read about how the original uh, uh, you know incubator had uh, an air filter system. It had fans. It had a uh, regulated temperature at uh, 78, 80 degrees, uh, had a, a thermostat. I mean, it was very, very impressive for that time. Yeah, it, and as I say, it was created by an engineer. The hospitals tried their own versions. There were some doctors trying their own versions. Um, but this man who was an engineer was able to build a better mousetrap. Um and, you know, there was a much more interest in that time in Europe, especially um, France and Germany, 
in saving these babies because they were very worried about the declining birth rate over there. Oh. So they had a nationalistic interest in let's, um, you know, let's encourage people to have more children and let's keep every baby alive. In the United States, you had so many hungry mouths to feed that you just didn't have that same emphasis. Mm. How did you come upon this story? and How did you trip upon it, so to speak? I tripped upon it because I was doing some research uh, about the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, the Century of Progress. That's not the famous World's Fair with the Ferris wheel that everybody thinks about. This was a Depression-era World's Fair, and it was all about science and technology and how science and technology would lift us to a higher plane, um, which is a little bit chilling when you think about it from mm. the other side of the atom bomb, the Holocaust. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but meanwhile, here's this piece of technology that's this life-saving equipment, and it's on the midway. It was so odd to me to just look at that picture, you know, and when I realized that he was also on Coney Island for 40 years and Atlantic City for 40 years, then I thought, well, how could this be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what attracted me to your book. I said, how could this be? And then we have, and your your own father went to this World's Fair? He did. Well, um, you know, uh, everybody who could went to this World's Fair. It was a great World's Fair at the very bottom. It was 1934, you know, through 33 and 34. It was a terrible time period. It was the bottom of the Depression. It was the Dust Bowl. You had gangsters in the city. This was the year Hitler rose to power in Germany. Um, and Chicago throws this big world there, which is a giant valentine to the future. The future will be better. And, you know, in the same way that the movies were kind of depression-proof, anybody who could wanted to go to this fair. Um, and you found that your father went and left... Um notes about it he went well he what i found was a little uh it was probably a school assignment it was like a little autobiography that he wrote oh. and he just happened to mention that he went to that world <laughs> fair and later i found yeah my grandmother had saved a box of souvenirs from that fair oh. and people did save their souvenirs because mm -hmm. if you went during the depression and you bought something then even if it was a trinket you saved it well you know i, I can relate to you know, the power of those World's Fairs, because when I was six years old, I went to the 1962 uh, Seattle World's Fair that was had a lot of exhibits about the future, and I still remember that experience vividly because of all the futuristic buildings and exhibits that had uh, uh, impact on me as a kid. So I, I understand what you're talking about in relation to your father and other people attracted to what the future held, but it's interesting that the the incubation sideshow uh, offered a great peek into the future and what would be possible with primies, and yet people tended, it seems, to see it only as that, a sideshow. Um, they, yes, they did. I found it strange that it was on the Midway, although in Chicago it began to mark a turning point because Dr. Julius Hess was there and because there was a health commissioner um, named Dr. Herman Bundesen, they both really wanted to turn the tide and get some public health policy going for preemies in Chicago. Um, and so Cooney had something that they needed, which was basically what he called himself was a propaganda machine. He could get the publicity in a way that they couldn't, and they helped him. So he threw a baby reunion um, in the summer of 34, and it was broadcast from coast to coast. And it, it really, I think, you know, made a difference. And right after that, Chicago became the first country in the nation to have really dedicated public health care for premature babies, which eventually became uh, the model for the rest of the country. So that was a turning point. How did you, one of, the, one of the things you mentioned in the early part of your book is that there was uh, uh, poor record keeping in relation to these babies and what happened to them. How did you manage to track them down? It was really hard to find this because, yeah, people who run sideshows and carnivals don't necessarily keep the kind of records <laughs> yeah, that you would love to have. And one thing I desperately tried to find was he apparently did have a book with all the names, and I think it was probably thrown out. 
Um, but I just started, like, I would look and see, you know, 100-year-old newspaper articles where a parent might be quoted with the name of their baby, and then I'd look around, I'd see if there was a family in that town with the same name. You know, I was writing letters to people like, um, you know, could this have been your mother? Is it possible that this was your family? Um, and some of them, yeah, turned out to be the right person. I went on World Fair forums. Um, one woman uh, who was in the book actually did have her own stuff online. Um, and I, so I gradually began to find these people. Wow. What a, how long did this take you? This was, it was about four years. I actually did the first research in Chicago, uh, I think, all the way back in 2007. But um, it was four years of really consistent work. And did it start out as um, as a kind of newspaper story that you were working on, and then you said there's a book in this? At, at what point did you realize it was a bigger project? than? No, actually, I really thought I was going to write a novel set at the Chicago World oh. Fair. I was fascinated oh. by it. And when I saw this story and I saw its implications and that it was also in other places around the country, I realized this is a story that I need to tell and I want to tell the real story. The other uh, great book about the World's Fair, it's quite a different one, is uh, Devil in the White City, right? Oh, yes, yes. But that's a different World's Fair. That's a different World's Fair. And it, it's really interesting to me that most people have never even heard of this Depression-era World's Fair in Chicago, mm -hmm. including me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I was growing up, my, all, my, my grandparents were in Chicago. Both my parents were from Chicago. I never heard a word about this. They must have gone. Uh, unfortunately, they had passed away by the time oh. I decided <laughs> to become interested in this. Mm -hmm. But um, it's almost like this this World's Fair has been forgotten. Well, what is uh, the most interesting thing that you came across or discovered in doing this research that uh, perhaps is not even in the book? Hmm. I think I put most of it in there that I could. Mm -hmm. um, but I just it kept making me think about... Um, how we use technology, how we think about it in terms of saving lives, that, you know, here you had a life-saving technology that was not being used, um, and we still have all kinds of questions about when you have extreme life-saving technology. You know, whose lives should be saved? Is it ever cruel to save a life? Um, you know, you have, now you have all kinds of genetic testing available. Which lives have value? I, to me, I looked at this and I thought, you know, we are, we're still making decisions like this. Mm -hmm. Don't hospitals uh, now, don't hospitals still have a kind of protocol that says if you're, if you're born, you know, I don't know what the, the week is, but they have some sort of cutoff where it's too, you know, it's too much of a preemie, we, we, we can't go. You know, we can't do that. No. I, you know, I think there is a point where they may have to make certain decisions, and mm -hmm. I think it also probably depends, too, on um, not just the gestation, but the, whatever condition that baby is in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did get to tour the night queue at Morgan Stanley Children's, which is just an amazing, amazing hospital in New York City and, and just one of the best in the world. And it's incredible what they can do. But, you know, yeah, there are certain times when you make a decision like uh, if this baby survives, um, will it be so severely co compromised that mm. it's just cruel? Right. You know, and then you see these this heartbreaking stories recently that were coming out of uh, London. It was Charlie Card, where the where the courts have decided that uh, a baby is hopeless and terminal, and the parents are legally forbidden to remove the child and try to seek treatment elsewhere. Yeah, that wasn't that a case where they brought the baby to New York. No, they weren't. Oh, they weren't allowed to. Oh, they I, were not allowed to. Oh. The baby died in London. The court oh. ruled against the parents. Oh, okay. I, I thought there was a case where they eventually got permission, so to speak, but it was too late. I think it may, it may you know, while they were discussing it, I don't even know if they got the formal permission, but mm -hmm. I think that the doctor in New York was then saying this argument had gone on for so oh, long that I it see. was too late. What about uh, the case of, of uh, doctors currently in medical school? Do they learn about your story? I mean, not yours in particular, but they, do they learn about Dr. Cooney? I don't think so. I think, you know, when I've talked to neonatologists, they've kind of heard of him. 
mm-hmm. and they're really fascinated by it. It's interesting, but I don't know that they learn this much about him, no. Um, you know, it's it's hard because certainly uh, medical textbooks, medical history, peer-reviewed journals, mm-hmm. are. it's kind of hard to credit a showman. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, it's an interesting um, look at, again, how sometimes people outside of science discover the truth, and it's hard to break down those walls that are built by uh, people who think it should only be, you know, true scientists who should have the ability to say X, Y, or Z. I think of uh, the, the great Dr. John Snow in England, and, uh, you know, he's the one who discovered the connection between cholera and water, because uh, they always thought it was bad air, you know, that caused uh, these epidemics. And he had elaborate proof that this was so, but it w- went so much against the contemporary wisdom or the wisdom of that time in the medical community that they just wouldn't hear it. And they said, no, no, it's bad air, it's not water. And it took a long time for that shift to come. And so uh, and so, it's interesting that, that Cooney had all this great evidence, really, in children alive. I mean, what, what more evidence do you need? And yet still people resisted. They did resist. And, you know, unfortunately for him, he couldn't produce clinical evidence. Yeah. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't producing statistics, which would have helped him if he had been able to do that and publish mm-hmm. in medical journals. Um, that, I think, was maybe one of the stumbling blocks besides the fact that he was a carnival, you know, yeah. he was in a carnival. And was, he a, was he a doctor based upon your research? Was he actually trained that way? No? No. No, I can't find. First of all, there were people who checked the medical schools in Germany that he said he attended. And there's absolutely no record of his having matriculated there. And his immigration shows him um, you know, he was he came to New York when he was 18. So uh, it, there's I don't understand how he could have been in medical school at the time. Yeah. There's no medical license on record in the United States in the archives. And his story behind the scenes wobbled, too. If you pull out transcripts that he had very early on with some of the World Fair officials, it's pretty clear he was not. Well, Don, thank you so much for your time this morning. I know you have another interview to get to. And a uh, great book. A wonderful book. Best of luck. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, have a good day. You too. We've been talking to Don Raffel about her book, The Strange Case of Dr. Cooney, How a Mysterious European Showman Saved Thousands of American Babies. This book has had high praise from a lot of circles. Saturday Evening Post says that it is a compelling historic mystery uncovered. Kirkus Reviews says... Many readers will share Raphael's admiration of Cooney. The book's title is no hype. There is a startling account of an improbable huckster who made his living promoting a life-saving device. He really did change the world in relation to these little tiny babies that were always considered unsavable before. You'll like the book. Pick it up. The Strange Case of Dr. Cooney. For Good Books Radio, I've been your host today, Dr. W.F. Strong. As always, here's hoping that all your books are good reads. 